I'm sorry, I couldn't, I couldn't quite hear you. The volume is a bit low. I, I'll ask uh, the directors here to, to tune it up. I, I think I was, I'm, I'm meant to go over the shortlist one more time. Uh, that was what I was asked to do. So I'll just, I'll do that quickly before I Indeed. announce. Uh, yeah, I'll do that before. So, so thanks very much to you, to all of the organizers. Uh, we had a really interesting session uh, discussing this shortlist. Uh, it took a bit of time to come to an agreement because uh, these entries are so different uh, and they're all strong in, in very different ways. Some of them were these huge, wide-ranging cross-border cooperations uh, involving dozens of journalists, while others uh, were much more narrow um, in their focus, but they were nonetheless uh, brilliant pieces of journalistic work. So I'll just quickly run through uh, the shortlist. Uh, we had uh, the Daphne project, uh, which was an IJ for EU supported investigation, uh, which uh, followed up um, on, on high level corruption in Malta. Uh, we had the Ibiza affair, which was a cooperation between Spiegel, Süddeutsche Zeitung and Falter uh, about this extraordinary case uh, that we remember, I think, all of us uh, of the Strache uh, video in Austria. Uh, we had the Troika laundromat, uh, which was coordinated by the OCCRP uh, into a huge network of offshore companies that were used for money laundering. Uh, we then had the FinCEN files, another massive investigation coordinated by the ICIJ, uh, you, involving more than 100 outlets. Uh, we had Lost in Europe, uh, which was an, another IJ for EU supported investigation. Uh, and this one was about the fates of uh, migrant children who have gone missing in Europe. Uh, the next one we had was another story uh, coordinated by OCCRP. Uh, which was the dodgy paperwork undermining Europe's COVID fight. Uh, I think the title there is, is pretty self-explanatory. We had the Global Anti-Abortion Misinformation Project, which was coordinated by Open Democracy, uh, looking into how American Christian conservative groups uh, use misinformation. We had another OCCRP coordinated uh, investigation, the Fraud Factory, uh, which was about the work of a scam call center in Kiev that these activities stretched uh, across Europe. Uh, we had Invisible Workers, uh, which was uh, an investigation by Lighthouse Reports, the Spiegel, Media Part, and Euronews which looked into working conditions on European farms. And finally, uh, we had Luanda Leaks, which was another one coordinated by the ICIJ. Uh, and this one was on uh, offshore money coming out of Angola. Uh, so it was uh, a really great shortlist. As I say, very, very different um, uh, types of investigation. We, we were really impressed by them all. Um, I will now um, announce the first one that we picked. Uh, and this was a story uh, that we thought was, especially in a year when most people's attention has been on coronavirus, it was really important to uh, remember the, the terrible stories of about the abuses of rights of migrants and particularly child migrants uh, and so we decided to to give the, the uh, one of our awards to lost in europe uh, which was the collaboration between um, belgium italy netherlands uk uh, and we were really um, impressed and saddened by the results of of, of this investigation very, very impressive shortlist that you have shared with us. Indeed, I can imagine, especially for you as the chair of the jury, that it was quite a difficult selection to come up with uh, the so-called winners. I think all of them are winners. All of them who produce such high quality piece of journalism are winners. But as it is, we only have three prizes. And thank you 
for awarding the first one. Now, if I if if I'm not mistaken, we have the winner. We have the winner uh, online to receive this virtually anyway. Obviously, uh, uh, you're not here in person for the most obvious reasons to uh, to uh, take it into reception. But uh, certainly, this will be coming to you forth. Let's hear from the winners. Thank you. Thank you, uh, IJ, for EU for giving the, us, uh, firstly, a chance to, to do this investigation and now reward us for us. It's really unexpected and it's really an honor to get this. Um, our words are just of pride, uh, proud of our uh, team of investigative journalists. Uh, we grow by the speed of trust, we are, but we are now with 23 journalists in Europe. Um, it's too long to name them all, but uh, I'll do that uh, by uh, the countries. We are in Greece, Romania, Lithuania, Croatia, Belgium, Switzerland, Italy, Germany, and the Netherlands, and UK. Um, this research is very special for us because we investigated how uh, Vietnamese miners uh, were um, uh, disappeared in, within Europe after registration. Um, and we learned three things, the, how vulnerable children are in, in trafficking and that they are actually exploited and uh, that our journalistic ethics uh, must be of a very high standard. Uh, we seriously need to take the disappearances uh, from reception uh, centers into account even when the authorities sometimes make us believe otherwise. Plus we saw how uh, valuable a joint cross-border investigation is because the criminal organizations that are behind this um, do not respect those borders. So uh, we need to work together for that. Um, if within this uh, uh, investigation, we work with the four countries, you already named them. I would like to add the names of the investigative journalists uh, with that. Uh, from Belgium, we have Christophe Klerix. He uh, published in Knak, Dorentina Isma, uh, Islamai. She was from VRT. Uh, Rulan Termote and Wouter Wouse, thank you, they, they published in the standard. Uh, the trafficking of Vietnamese miners in Ger Germany was uh, investigated by Adrian Bartocha and Jan Wiese from R RBB and RAD. And um, in uh, the UK we had Ismael Ainash, it's a pleasure to work with you, he published in the Garden, Guardian. Um, and we have Huub Jaspers and Sonneter Linge, they published from Argos. And I would like to give a special thanks to this last person, Sanne Terlinge. Sanne, you are the mastermind of, uh, of behind this all. And um, I and many people um, in, in this team, we are very proud to work with you. Uh, the award is a team effort, but uh, we owe this investigation to you. Thank you, Sanne, and thank you, the rest of the team. Thank you all. Well, huge congratulations to you for the very fine work that you have produced. Well deserved uh, this prize, of course, which is waiting uh, for you. I'm sure the IJ4EU will get it to you in some shape or form uh, physically. Uh, now we talk so much about your documentary, of course, for those who may not be... Handel met Vietnamese kinderen in Europa. Man hat mir nicht gesagt, welche Arbeit und wie lange. Nur dass es nach Deutschland geht. Die sind klein, so 40, 50 Kilo Maximum. Diese jungen Menschen mussten schreckliche Erfahrungen machen. Man kann das so bezeichnen, es ist letztlich moderne Sklaverei. In Wahrheit standen diese Kinder unter enormem Druck, denn sie müssen ja die Schulden an die Menschenhändler bezahlen. Ein gesamtliches Untersuch von RBB, Argos und Lost in Europe. Uh, we're in Leipzig. It's cold outside. It's, it's, it's bearable here. So, looking at my tag team, we neither seem to have Nasira or Andre or the winner. Is that correct? Uh, well, almost. There you go. Now I'm hearing someone. Who is this? This is Andrzej Rojek. Andrzej? Uh, yes, I am 
I, I haven't heard you for the last five minutes, so I'm sure you pretty much said whatever I am supposed to say. Uh, well, and I, cannot... well, I, I tried to call upon you a few times, that is correct, but now that I have you online, let me make full use of you. I already uh, took away a bit the suspense, but uh, at the end of the day, you were a jury member and this should be your task. Tell us, tell us who won the second prize and why. Uh, so, I, I actually will not tell you who won the second prize. The, the winner will be announced by Nasira, and uh, Nasira and Moadim in a second. I will just say this, that the second award is really the sign of times. The recipient discovered through painstaking international cross-border research a network of fraudulent transactions um, um, aimed to cover up theft of public funds by corrupt politician, politicians, plural. Now, this sounds familiar, doesn't it? We have not, we have seen this before, and we have heard these kind of situations before, way too often. Yet, this group of people, all 40 of them, in 17 countries, managed to publish uh, in 19 media outlets, the results of their, of their uh, work almost two years ago, uh, the results had a positive impact. The, uh, they impacted the institutions in question. So kudos to them. And I want Nasira to reveal the secret. Indeed, we all want that. Uh, it would be lovely to hear from her. Na uh, Nasira, are you with us now? No, it doesn't seem to, to be that way. So, um, at the end of the day, I think we gave it enough of a shot. So we tried repeated times. I am here. Yes, is this? This is Nasira, yes. What, what a lovely treat to hear your voice. It, it almost <laughs> seemed like I discovered gold uh, uh, after some time here. So, uh, we've been eagerly waiting for you impatiently. Uh, because as a jury member, of course, and uh, we're very eager to find out from you uh, yeah. who, who won, who won the second prize of the evening. Yeah, and I'm very glad to announce to you that the, the impact of our winner is Troika Laundromat. Wonderful. Applause. And, uh, and, and uh, perhaps as a jury member, uh, can you tell us what, what intrigued you about this particular piece of journalism? Yes, for sure. As all the, the other member, uh, member juries say that we were all impressed by the work of the investigations. Um, very, very impressed. But with the Troy Calandraman, I was really impressed about the level of disclosures and the work on the data. Uh, there was 1,300,000 banking transactions from more than uh, 230,000 companies. So it's it's a huge work on the data. So uh, I was very impressed impressed about this work. And there's also impressed about the significant efforts to build a reachable information with all the inter inter interactive uh, graphics online. Uh, there was a great exposure of the work published in 19 European and non-European media outlets, Andrew said it before, and a great impact also with the creation of an anti-money laundering watchdog by the European Parliament. So uh, very, very pleased to announce this, this uh, winner award and very, very glad to, to give this, uh, this award tonight. Indeed, and I believe we have uh, the proud winner uh, with us. Uh, uh, tell us, this is your prize. How, how are you feeling? Hi, uh, I'm actually feeling amazing. Uh, Troy Colondromat was by far the biggest work of my life, and uh, I'm extremely happy. And uh, I want to share the happiness with the entire team. Uh, thanks to all the guys from UCCRP. Thanks to all the guys who worked on the story from across Europe. Uh, this was an, an amazing collaboration. And there's one uh, particular thing I want to stress. Uh, a lot of the work we did with Troy Calandromat would have been impossible without the work previously done by Roman Anin and his team in Russia. 
Uh, as many of you know, uh, Roman's uh, flat has been raided by FSB, uh, so was his office, and now he's being targeted by a very dodgy government probe. So uh, this award, the honor and the thanks and all of our support go, goes to Roman Anin. Hold on, guys. Huge congratulations also from our side here in Berlin. I don't know if you can see it quite clearly. This is your award. Uh, It'll, it'll get to you in some shape or form, no doubt. Uh, and of course, once again, stressing the collaborative nature and effort that was uh, put into this work, uh, of which we will take a quick look at now in, in shape of a, form, a short clip. This is Troika Dialogue, once Russia's premier investment bank. And this was Troika's president, Ruben Vardanyan, a Russian-Armenian businessman who is known for his friendly relationships with the West. Publicly, Troika was a powerful financial institution led by one of Russia's most progressive businessmen. Behind the scenes, the bank was devising a hidden system of offshore companies that helped Russia's elites launder money, hide their assets, and evade the law. Here is how Troika's laundromat worked. Troika established three offshore companies in the British Virgin Islands. These three companies paid formation agents to establish dozens of other companies to funnel the money out of Russia. Money flowed between these companies in a coordinated network. Many of the transactions were disguised as fake trade contracts and loans. This system allowed corrupt politicians and organized crime to buy luxury goods with complete anonymity. To make this transfer of money possible, Troika needed a bank that would turn a blind eye to its dubious financial transactions. Enter Yukio Bankas, a Lithuanian bank that shuffled millions of dollars through Troika's system before it was closed by regulators. Troika also relied on unwitting proxies to obscure the identity of the shell company's real owners. Reporters spoke to this man, an Armenian construction worker, who was unaware that his signature appears on financial agreements worth more than $70 million in the laundromat. So who was benefiting from this multi-billion dollar network? You might recognize some of the names in this cast of characters. Companies affiliated with Sergei Roldugin, a cellist and alleged proxy of Putin, received $69 million from the pipeline. The family of Vladimir Ochikov, the former governor of the Samara region of Russia, used money from the pipeline to purchase a $16.6 million property in Spain. Vardanin himself used $3.2 million from the pipeline to pay his credit card and his children's school fees in London. These names are just the tip of the iceberg. Reporters found more than 75 companies and hundreds of millions of dollars connected to the Troika network. When reporters spoke to Vardanyan, he said he couldn't be aware of all of Troika's transactions and that his bank acted legally. There is no definitive proof that Vardanyan knew of Troika's scheme and he has not been accused of wrongdoing by authorities. But by pulling back the curtain on this scheme, we see how Troika allowed powerful people to move their vast wealth offshore for their own gain, at the detriment of the countries they live in and the quality of life for everyday citizens. Indeed, a very, very intricate uh, story, intricate web to untangle. And therefore, a huge congratulations to all the journalists who were involved 
in this documentary in Troika Laundromat. Thank you so much uh, for your work. Thank you, of course, Nasira, for announcing uh, the winner. Uh, and uh, now we go on, uh, last but certainly not least, uh, to uh, the third prize of uh, the evening. And uh, this time I'm quite relieved to already see one of the speakers with us. It's always a good sign when the moderator already knows someone is lined up. It is Teresa Ribeiro, of course. She's the o OSCE's representative on freedom of uh, media. Lovely to have you with us. We're supposed to also have with us Christian Jensen, editor-in-chief of Politiken. I don't see him quite yet. Maybe he'll join us in just a bit. But in the meantime, Teresa, uh, tell us who won the third prize of the evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm very, very happy to announce that the third winner is the Daphne Project. It's a very, uh, it's a great example uh, of collaborative cross-border investigative journalism continuing the work of Daphne Caruana Galicia, uh, the Maltese investigative journalist who paid the highest price for her journalistic uh, work. Today, in times of growing disinformation and distrust in the media, this kind of work is perhaps more important than ever. But Christian, I think you are here with us, so can you please say something? Let's see if we have Christian Jensen, the editor-in-chief of Politiken with us. Christian, can you hear us? Is your mic turned on? Is your camera turned on? Are you joining us? Nope, doesn't seem to be that way, Teresa. Uh, okay, I will go on. Just unfortunately, it's also as dangerous as ever, uh, the investigative journalism, uh, with journalists who unveil the sometimes sordid relations between politics and big money, receiving countless threats and often, uh, often, oftentimes uh, face very serious legal uh, reper uh, repercussions. Like uh, Daphne Garwana Calizia herself, who faced over 40 libel law lawsuits filed by companies, government officials, and individuals, described by her son Matthew as a never ending type of torture. Uh, and like Jan Kusiak, the Slovak journalist who was killed in 2018 after investigating tax fraud by several businessmen with connections to top-level Slovak politicians. Uh, we need the work of these brave people who unveil the uncomfortable truths that keep our authorities accountable and fight against possible corrupt elements, elements that undermine and erode our democracies. Therefore, we need to ensure that media can do their work safely. We need to be clear that there can be no impunity for the ones who threaten or attack our media. And we need awards like this one to honor such great projects like Daphne Project, working relentlessly to keep unveiling truth in the name of a journalist who gave her life for this cause. Well deserved uh, indeed. And thank you, Teresa, for providing uh, an insight and overview of uh, the Daphne project. Now let's hear, of course, uh, from the proud uh, winners. Who's with us? Please turn on your camera and your microphone so that we can hear and see you. Of course, we want to see your yes. uh, face, your lucky face, your happy face, now that you've won, well-deserved. Take it away, please. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's great to be with you. I would like, first of all, uh, to thank uh, IG4IU uh, for this award and to have... Um, uh, supported Forbidden Stories and, and, and the Daphne project for so long. 
um, for those who didn't know Daphne, she was a, a prominent Maltese journalist um, investigating corruptions at the highest state level uh, in Malta. And she was killed on the 16th of October 2017 in a car bomb. And after a murder, a group of uh, 45 journalists from 15 countries uh, decided to investigate her murder and try to continue her work. So I would like to thank uh, thanks all of them tonight. And perhaps I, I can name some of them because some are part of this conference. So Juliette Garside from The Guardian, Jacob Borg from Times of Malta, Bastian and Frédéric Obermeyer from Sudeutsche Zeitung, Stephen Gray from uh, Reuters, uh, Anne Michel and Jean-Baptiste Chaston from Le Monde. And of course, there are um, many others. And um, I have a special thought tonight to Matthew, Paul and Andrew, the, the sons of Daphne. Um, since the assassination of their mother, um, they have, fight, uh, have fought every day to uh, get the truth and to obtain justice. And uh, I think they are um, a true inspiration. Thank you. No, thank you for uh, the very, very important work and light that you have shed throughout the Daphne project. May her death not be in vain, indeed. Uh, thank you so much and huge congratulations. This you. is uh, your prize and thank you, Teresa, for setting it all up for us. Thank you so much and all the best. Of course, before we go, for those who may not have seen of the Daphne project. Let's have a quick look. That was a clip, of course, from the Daphne project. surprise for you uh we actually have one more prize up our sleeve so this evening not three winners but four winners actually will be announced and for that please welcome back lutz kinkel who kicked off today's uh, session today's uh, conference uh, lutz uh, Tell us what's behind the fourth prize. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ali. Um, this is really surprising. And this is probably the first prize award that I'm attending, at least, that is extended on the fly. So we had three prizes, but we have now a fourth one. Also, the fourth one is uh, connected with some prize money. It's 5,555 euros. This money is also not only meant as an award and as a motivation, but also as money to keep on working. Uh, I think every investigative uh, journalist is badly in need of some financial means, because as we all know, the investigations are costly. So, um, yeah, well, we have this prize and I will add this to the three ones. And By I will all means. tell you now. Of course. Who gets it? Well, um, this is one more investigation that is led by OCC PR, uh, OCCRP, sorry, uh, and the investigation is called Fraud Factory. Fraud Factory, it's a criminal group in Kiev uh, that is targeting elderly people to cut them off their fortune. Um, more concrete, it is the Milton Group offering fake investments in Bitcoins and stealing the money from their clients. Uh, a lot of them are pensioners and they lost everything. Um, the whistleblower that made this story possible said um, the instruction he got every morning was to squeeze out the customer until the last cent. This story, and we will see a video also about the story, has everything that you wish from investigative journalism. You have a whistleblower that uh, really took a high risk. Uh, to uh, unveil, uh, un, uh, to reveal the facts. Uh, you have a global impact because this group in Kiev um, was um, was working with clients all over the world. And you have a follow the money trail. It is, um, and this is how I would sum it up, a classical cross-border investigative 
journalism piece at its best. Um, have a look at the video and see this investigation. Vi utrustar vår källa med en dold, högupplöst kamera med ljudupptag. Under loppet av flera månader och med stora risker för sin egen säkerhet samlar han dagligen in information och skickar över till Dagens Nyheter. Från en hyrd lägenhet på andra sidan gatan ser vi in genom fönstren och kan iaktta Milton Groups säljare. Företagets lokaler är hårt bevakade med övervakningskameror i alla rum. Alla som ska in på kontoret stoppas och tvingas lämna ifrån sig sina privata biltelefoner. Men den dolda kameran fortsätter att spela in. On the instruction every morning, the order was to squid the money from the clients. Till the last cent. This was the video. You heard the quote. Um, squeeze them out until the last cent. I hope we have uh, the winners with us. Uh, if that's the case, please turn on your mics and please turn on your camera so that we can virtually give you the prize and have a word by you. If that's not the case, I can only say thank you. And uh, this is a really impressive piece, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to present that. Right now, I see Matthias Karlsson, right? He's with us. So, Matthias, well, congratulations, and um, the floor is yours. We can see you and hopefully hear you also in a, in a few seconds. Matthias, can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Maybe you have to unmute your microphone. Indeed, the microphone, a classic during the pandemic. Matthias, we saw you quite clearly. Uh, we just couldn't hear you. So do turn on your camera and more importantly, turn on your microphone. Because obviously we want to hear from you. Let's give it one more try. Yeah. Let's try again. It looked good. It looked good. Unfortunately, we couldn't yeah. hear anything. Yeah, uh, here, here he is. He seems to be back. back again. Matthias, turn on your camera and your microphone. Hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, Wonderful. now we hear you. Sorry, I was totally unprepared. Uh, <laughs> um, well, uh, thank you so much. Matthias, could you tell us a little bit about the investigation? It was, it's really impressive and it, it's obviously also a global investigation because, well, these people, the Milton Group, so-called Milton Group, had clients all over the world, not only in Europe, but all over the world. You picked up some Swedish examples, right? Yeah. Um, but the clients, so-called clients, were all over the world. Yeah, exactly. What, what these, uh, the whistleblower we had uh, inside the Milton Group, he managed to extract uh, data from the uh, client database uh, from Milton uh, and from the uh, phones they used to, uh, to call the victims. So he was sending me via WhatsApp uh, the uh, contact lists from, from the sales manager's phones. And we were then, uh, you know, uh, distributing these numbers uh, for, for each country uh, to, you know, from South America and in uh, Europe and uh, in America as well, we had a few, few victims. So, uh, yeah, this was a really uh, big, um, 
you know, cooperation with uh, verifying his story through the victims uh, that talked to us uh, and, and uh, about how they were being uh, scammed in exactly the same way. I mean, the stories we heard, you know, from the uh, for, for uh, northern Sweden and from, you know, from all over Europe was almost uh, identical how they were, you know, uh, scammed. Could you tell us uh, just one or two sentences? What is the Milton Group doing today? Is it still existing? Uh, yeah, well, well, the, well, what I understand is that they uh, rebranded it uh, a bit and they changed their names. But uh, as far as I can tell, uh, I mean, they're still at it, uh, you know, uh, and there is plenty of these uh, scams going around uh, still. and. Uh, uh, in the follow-up investigations we did, we also reveal how, um, you know, um, big uh, internet companies like, for example, Google, uh, you know, sell uh, advertisements to promote these kind of uh, scams with the, with the uh, celebrity fake ads uh, that we, I guess, everyone have seen them sometimes at Facebook or, or elsewhere. And um, so... I think one one of the uh, biggest insights uh, after this uh, story was that how um, how difficult it is for for the law enforcement to actually get to the uh, responsibles, even though they had the whistleblower that you know we after the before the story was published, he left Ukraine, and he's uh, in a witness protection program now, and he gave all the material to the Swedish police, and it, that in turn shared it with the European. Um, uh, prosecutor's uh, office and uh, but still you know one year after this there's not a single charge no one is you know even close to getting arrested so yeah it's uh, really sad there's something left to do yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you for this investigation it is really impressive we are very proud of i think this prize is more than deserved you are the fourth winner of this evening i mean the surprise winner yes, the more lucky we are so and uh, i think we are ending the ceremony here indeed uh, so uh, I, I sense a sequel coming for sure part two uh, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen yeah. uh, this not only wraps up the uh, impact award uh, ceremony the ij for eu impact award ceremony Con huge congratulations again to all winners but actually it wraps up the very first day of the Uncovered uh, Conference. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you took a lot with you and out of this. I certainly did. Uh, and uh, yeah, Lutz, uh, all uh, that is left to do is tell our viewers that please be back here. This only wraps up day one. We'll be back here tomorrow uh, for day two. Again, starting time at 2 p.m. Looking forward to seeing you all back here. Have a good evening or a good day, depending on from where you're joining us here in Leipzig. It's uh, me, it's Ali Aslan and Lutz Kinkel wishing you all the best and hoping to see you back here at 2 p.m. All the best. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Cheers. Cheers.